J'ai tout 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 tendu, tout 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 j'ai tout 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 détendu, 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 tout 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 détendu, 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 j'ai That was Annika Kildegard and Will Yeager with Ligament. Thank you ever so much. We live indeed in a very fortunate community with all of this talent. Just a little beginner aperitif, if you will, of this afternoon's incredible opportunity to share. This series started, this is our 37th presidential lecture. President Friedman started these with the idea of expanding our knowledge of collegiate work that's going on to promote interdisciplinary learning and understanding. Also to showcase some of the incredible work that's going on on our campus. And very importantly, to invite the entire community to come and join us so that we can share some of our wonderful talent with the broader community. So in that spirit, I'm very, very welcome to uh, introduce today's very special lecture. We've had over the years uh, physicists, engineers, 
We've talked about climate change. We've talked about uh, diabetes research. We've talked about uh, philosophy, religious issues. And today, I think you're going to be very, very interested in what Corey has to say. You've got in front of you a, a, a brochure describing today's events. Uh, I won't belabor what you can read in there. Instead, we've reached out to some of her colleagues and asked them specifically for comments. Uh, sorry, <laughs> but you're safe. You know you're safe. Um, Corey Peak Asa is a uh, serves in a number of capacities on our campus. She's a professor of occupational environmental health, uh, associate dean for research in the College of Public Health, and director of the Injury Pre Injury Prevention Research Center. And I think we're going to learn a lot about all three of those here today. She also serves, as, as many of us on campus know, uh, in a number of key critical positions across campus in, in, in providing service to our greater university, particularly in the Path Forward teams. Um, she's truly a superb scholar, teacher, and leader on our campus. And I think you'll see some of that coming up in some of these quotes and comments. Um, Corey's colleague, Carrie Castile, Associate Professor of Occupational Environmental Health, Associate Director for the Injury Prevention Research Center, and Director of the Occupational Injury Prevention Program, uh, says the following, quote, Carrie has unique big ideas that are on point and relevant, and as such thrives as a leader. One of her strongest traits is her support and mentoring of students and junior faculty. She has a lot of responsibility as an associate dean, professor, and center director, but she's always prioritized mentoring of her colleagues. And you can also see how Corey is, is, is effective in the words of her experiences, indeed, from those mentees. And here are a few. Kara Harmon, um, clinical associate professor of epidemiology and an assistant director in the Injury Prevention Research Center says, quote, Dr. Peek Asa was my mentor for the, my 2008 PhD, my postdoc, and now as a faculty member. She's amazing. She's superb. She's a superb, genuine, and passionate about her work. We do a lot of research together and have also been able to travel together for research purposes. Corey is fun to travel with and has been a good role model for, ha for having balance in life and that is important, to, and that is that it's important to take time for yourself and family and the important things in life beyond just being in the classroom and the research. Carrie Harlan, Associate Research Scientist with the Transportation and Vehicle Safety Policy Research Program in the Department of Emergency Medicine in the Carver College of Medicine, shares a similar story when she says, Corey is passionate about improving the lives of children through mentoring the next generation of scientists. Dr. P. Asa has been my mentor since 2008. And what I appreciate the most about her is how strongly she believes in her mentees, even when we not, may not believe in ourselves. For example, I clear remember, clearly remember Corey giving me the advice that life is messy. And when you feel overwhelmed by the daily mess of to-do lists and meetings, refocus on the larger goal of what you want to accomplish both in your career and your personal life. I cannot recall the number of times this advice has been brought calm to my mess and reminded me of my true calling to improve the lives of children. In his letter of a nomination, then interim dean of the College of Public Health, Keith Muller, called Corey the leading injury control researcher of her generation. In a world where violence and injury are in the news every day, her research is never more relevant and important than it is today. We're indeed very fortunate to have such a nationally and internationally renowned scholar and accomplished and caring researcher, teacher, mentor for our faculty here in our midst. And I know you're going to see all of this come together in a wonderful discussion. And I'd like to now turn the podium over. Corey, thank you.
thank you all for being here. I really appreciate all of the comments. And it's really great to look out and see so many people who have supported my mess uh, to, to bring me to this great opportunity. Um, so in 2018, whoops, Trust for America's Health released a report called Pain in the Nation that first identified what we call an epidemic of despair. Uh, so this was tracked by looking at causes of premature death, primarily rising rates of suicide, rising rates of death from overdoses and from alcohol-involved diseases. So one of our jobs at the University of Iowa's Injury Prevention Research Center is to track these types of outcomes. Uh, and so what we've learned is that we are not spared from this epidemic of despair. Uh, and so uh, led by our uh, IPRC deputy director, who is here with us today, uh, we partner with the Iowa Department of Public Health to collect data for the Iowa Violent Death Reporting System. It's part of a national program that's the first effort to create comprehensive data that looks at multiple circumstances relating to homicides, and suicides. And so, for example, it's the only source of data we can go to to find the relationship between a homicide perpetrator um, and the victim. Um, so that's really helpful. And what we are able to see is that we have a fairly steady rise in suicide rates in Iowa starting in the year 2000. And what's more important when we think about premature death being of a, of a great um, important to our society is that almost half of our deaths are to people under the age of 44, uh, and a good almost 20% of them among our youth. Also led by our uh, associate director, Carrie Castile, and our communications director, Ann Saba, we do quite a bit of work in opioid and substance use overdoses. Uh, and in fact, just last week, we, re we released our second uh, statewide report about policies to reduce the opioid epidemic. Uh, this one focused on rural Iowa. And uh, so we do a lot of work in the Injury Center to bring policymakers together to prioritize what are the steps we need to take. Uh, part of the work uh, led by Carrie and Ann is tracking these trends. And what we can see is that we have rising opioid death rates uh, at a time when we actually have not done much to reduce death rates from things like methamphetamines. So sitting in my ivory tower in the Injury Prevention Research Center, I think about these things that are people's worst nightmares. Homicide, suicide, deaths from car crashes. They are things that derail our families and individuals, but also they can cost our societies in ways we don't ever understand. Uh, the psychological impact, the physical impact from a dis disabling injury, uh, all the way down to the financial impact from these uh, in our schools, in our workplaces, in our societies. And so what I hope to accomplish in our uh, lecture today is to bring together some of the thinking I've been doing about how do we work better to reduce these injuries. Uh, we know in the United States, for example, injuries are the leading cause of death starting at the age of one and going through the age of 44. Uh, so they might not cause as many deaths as cancer and cardiovascular disease, uh, but they certainly are causing a lot more premature deaths. So we want that to stop. Um, so today, one thing we're learning is that child adversity, um, which I'll define in, around this area of biology of trauma, is one of the underlying factors for a lot of health outcomes. Uh, and so we need to think about what are these underlying factors and how can we better prevent them for everybody. Uh, so we're going to talk about the biology of trauma. Um, then I'm going to talk about a framework, this endemic, that I think will help us work faster and more efficiently uh, to stem the tide of this rising um, epidemic of despair. And then throughout, I'm going to use some examples of the work that I do in collaboration with many people in this room, with many people around the world, uh, which makes my job feel so relevant uh, uh, to describe the type of impact we're trying to make. Um, so we're going to dive into the biology of trauma. And it starts with research that was conducted around adverse childhood experiences. So adverse childhood experiences are persistent extreme traumas that impact the way our brains develop. So they include abuse and neglect, but they also include higher levels of chronic persistent stressors, exposure to traumatic family stress like family violence, witnessing domestic abuse in the home, mental illness, criminal behavior in the home. But we're also recognizing that at the social level, we also see impacts. Uh, so things like neighborhood violence, discrimination, bullying, political instability, 
also contribute to these negative health outcomes um, that help organize the brain uh, of children. And so the early studies of adverse child experiences have indicated that people who've experienced six or more ACEs have a life expectancy 20 years earlier than people who have had none. What's also really compelling about what we're learning is that premature, this premature death is related to every single cause of death. Cancer, heart disease, flu and pneumonia, car crashes. And so it used to be that we thought the mechanism was that we experience child adversity, that leads us to experience health risk behaviors that then lead to premature death. But it's not really that simple. It turns out there are biological mechanisms that relate early childhood experiences to these premature deaths. I do think it's really important to point out two points. Um, one is that many people experience child adversity. We don't talk about it enough. So people who experience this adversity often feel very alone and isolated, and that compounds the stress. It's also important to note that because someone has experienced these adversities, they are not dictated to a life of poor health. And in fact, some people can come out with amazing reserves of resiliency and creativity, but we don't know why. Some can and some can't. What we do know is that any piece of positive environment can negate the deleterious effects. So a caring person, one caring person, one nurturing environment, uh, one structure or policy that helps that family work better can help balance out and negate these negative effects. So we have an opportunity uh, to invest and make sure that these poor health outcomes are not um, part of the pathway uh, from adverse child experiences. So why is it that there's this biological relationship between child adversity and poor health outcome? We're gonna talk a little bit about how the brain develops. So starting pretty much at conception and the beginnings of the nervous system through adulthood, your brain is constantly reacting to its in utero environment and then its early childhood environment. So especially when you're born, your brain starts cleaving neurons and responding and organizing around the environmental experience. And so starting at birth, uh, your brain pretty much develops from the back to the front in this sort of stacked way. Uh, so the very first jobs of an infant are to respond to the environment to identify what is your blood pressure? How do you normalize blood pressure? What is your heart rate? Um, what is the regulation of your body temperature? So as adults, if we have a stressful experience, it's gonna change our brain. And the more we experience that stress, the more persistent it is, the more our brain responds to that stress. Uh, so we see persistent changes in the brain uh, in things like post-traumatic stress disorder. But when you're an infant and you haven't matured the neuronal structures of your brain, your brain organizes around those stressful events. So you can imagine if an infant or a young child uh, is still in this period of really active brainstem development, their brain is gonna organize around persistent stress as being the normal environment that they're in. And that's gonna affect every step of brain development all the way up through the final steps. And so I do want to point out, because it's very interesting, um, the final steps of brain development are the connections between the frontal cortex and the limbic system, which is the emotional system. And that doesn't actually happen until the early 20s. Uh, and so the more we learn about brain development, the more we understand why teenagers can sometimes act like they're two. It's because they're having a rush of corticosteroids from their limbic system, and why they're like super smart, mature adults, and it's when their frontal cortex is taken over, but the connections between those aren't really quite ready uh, until the early 20s, so much so that the World Health Organization now defines the period of youth through the age of 23. Um, so I want to focus a little bit on this area that is highlighted. Uh, that is the area of the brain that when we feel a, a severe threat, it releases a cascade of chemicals that we all know is the fight or flight response. So if as an infant, you're constantly faced with these stresses that feel threatening to you, your brain organizes as if that is your normal environment. So your whole normal baseline is ramped up. And so you can imagine some of the symptoms are things like hyperreactivity, 
You're constantly in this fight or flight. You're hyper-reactive to the environment around you because you never know what may be coming from it. Um, but then what happens is it affects these other systems. Uh, so children that have had very extremely um, abusive environments often have problems with sleep. They have problems with time management. They have trouble paying attention. So you can imagine that creates a really difficult time interacting with our school environment, with our work environment, that creates not just a biological, uh, but an interactional challenge in the systems that we put these kids in. So we do know there are a growing number of biological mechanisms that I'll talk about uh, that lead from these adverse experiences to poor health outcomes. One, based on that fight or flight response, is overproduction of cortisol. So this cascade of neurochemicals that you get when you're in stressed environments. But when that happens over time, it creates this increased allostatic load so your body is constantly dealing with this high cortisol environment. Uh, and so basically, it's your brain thinking fight or flight is normal. We also know, because we have such advanced technologies in brain scanning, that kids in very adverse environments have less dense neuronal tissue, uh, so they literally have fewer active neurons in their brains, and those neurons are not as active in releasing calming neurotransmitters. In addition to those, we see, again, because of the stack development, uh, immune system dysregulation, but the balance between um, sort of this acute response of inflammation to stress, which we all experience. Um, and then long term, what happens is that there is a suppression of the immune system um, because of just your body is just too tired of dealing with all of the immune inflammation. Um, and so that's why in adults that have had, you know, extreme stress throughout their lives, immune systems are um, actually tampered down. So when you have gone through a really stressful period, and all of a sudden it's like, okay, that's over, and now I'm sick, this is why. That actually there's a reason. It's not your imagination <laughs> that you tend to get sick after stressful events. But there's also an interesting new tie to intestinal, intestinal permeability. So probably a lot of you are hearing more about this gut-brain connection, and we see that in how our immune system and our cortisol response impacts the way we absorb nutrients. And so anecdotally, uh, people who work with obese patients were constantly saying, you know, the number of my patients that talk to me about being abused sexually as children is really high. It doesn't make sense. And the thought was always that the, the, after child sexual abuse, there was a self-healing through overeating, and that led to the obesity. But it turns out it's more biologic than that, in that this altered immune system tied to your gut immunity leads to an impermeability of your body to take up nutrients, uh, and that is probably a stronger causal pathway of this link between early child sexual assault and obesity. And it's pretty compelling to think, what if preventing child sexual assault is one of the really important steps we can take to reduce our obesity epidemic? So we know that at the social level, Political instability is one of the stresses that really impacts kids. And so one example of a study that we've done uh, through a training program um, funded by the National Institutes of Health to fund emerging researchers in injury and violence prevention, um, we did a study looking at 520 youth in Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, whose parents were impacted by the Homeland War, which was the war that broke up former Yugoslavia. Uh, my colleague Nina Jovanovic is here. Uh, she's an author on this study. <laughs> Um, so what we found is that there was really quite a bit of adversity among these kids. For, for example, 15% of them witnessed violence in the home, and that their adversity was, ex was a, tied to alcohol use, drug use, suicidal ideation. These are the benchmarks of our epidemic of despair, but also related to dating violence, which we know is a um, pathway event towards having more severe intimate partner violence as adults, uh, and early sexual activity initiation. Um, so we're interested in how do these impacts work at multiple levels, and how do they work differently in different types of cultures, and how do we translate programs from one country and culture to another? So how do we think about reducing the burden of adverse child experiences and the many risk factors and health outcomes that are related to. And we know that building resilience among individuals, 
in families, in societies, in communities, can negate these effects. Even better than building resilience is starting with resilience. So children are born into communities where we know they have levels of resilience that, can, that can help reduce any deficits that they might find in their environments. So, in science, we're really comfortable pairing our research questions down to having one problem and one solution. Uh, it's really clean, and this is one example. We can solve really sophisticated problems by making equations and equating one problem to one solution. It doesn't work when we get into more complex problems. Uh, so, for example, with substance use disorder, people who use substance uses and become addicted, we can research the perfect rehabilitation program. We can research the perfect way to deliver it to every person who needs it. And we can find a way to do that in a really cost-effective way. And that is definitely a necessary step to reducing the rise we're seeing in substance use deaths. But it's not sufficient. It's not enough. Uh, so we can't really take one problem and figure out one solution. Um, so it's interesting that a colleague of mine talked about mess because a lot of the things I'm thinking about in my research world right now is that this is really messy. <laughs> we have complex underlying factors that contribute to complex health problems. So one problem, one solution becomes we have multiple problems. We have substance use. We have violence exposure. Um, we have systemic issues that are challenging. And we can't find a single solution. Um, so scientists hate this. I hate, this is messy. It's not the way you get funded. You can't write a multiple problem, multiple solution grant to NIH and expect them to give you a grant. So how can we come up with a science-driven framework that will help us move faster and make a bigger difference on these bigger social issues? So in uh, 2017, I was nominated to the National Academy of Medicine's um, Global Violence Forum. And what the forums of the National Academies do is hold symposiums to try to think about what's next in our field. Uh, and so I was also elected to the planning committee. And that gave me some, some say in how we were going to organize the work that we did for our next symposium. And there was a growing idea that I was very interested in with this notion of syndemics, uh, which are co-occurring epidemics. I'll define that a little bit more. Um, so we had the opportunity to bring in the people who defined what a syndemic is uh, and think about how does that work and how can we apply it to these pieces of our epidemic of despair. So a syndemic is basically a cluster of epidemics, epidemics that are synergistic with each other. Uh, and so when we have a health burden that is related to a number of different types of risk factors that interact with each other and tied to other health, health outcomes related to those same factors, we have a syndemic. Our epidemic of despair is a syndemic. The three pieces required to have a true syndemic are that there are multiple health outcomes that cluster. They have to cluster in time. We have our epidemic of despair clustering in time. We're seeing them all rise together. Uh, they cluster in space and population. So usually you see populations at greater risk than others. Uh, second, um, there are often interactions of risk factors. And in the true definition of a syndemic, these interactions are biologic. Uh, so the biologic mechanisms of how adverse childhood experiences change your brain so that you are more prone to use substances. And you also, that interacts with the fact that children who are in adverse experiences who have a lot of adverse experiences also tend to be clustered in environments where there are more substances in access to them, that they have access to. Um, and so these factors interact so that there's a higher likelihood of substance use. But then even on top of that, often the way your brain develops under high stress situations makes you more susceptible to become an addict when you do try using drugs. So it's kind of this stacked set of risk factors uh, that are all against you. But the piece of the syndemic that in public health I find the most interesting and compelling uh, is this notion of the social determinants. So to be a true syndemic, there have to be social level, political, social, cultural factors that are helping predict how do these outcomes cluster in time and space. So 
much of the social determinants is around the experience of poverty. Uh, so much so that the new talk is like the biology of trauma. There's also a lot of talk about the biology of poverty. Uh, it's not just that you are working in an environment that has few resources, but it biologically changes how you interact with your environment. So I next want to give you a very visceral example of how a syndemic can play out at the individual level. And this is from a project uh, led by Dr. Rachel Young, who is in the School of Journalism and Mass Communication. And Rachel and I and several others were very fortunate uh, to collaborate with the Oberman Center, which I think many of us have had the great experience. I think Teresa Mangum, the director, I saw her earlier, so I know she's here. Uh, so she was able to secure some funding um, that allowed a group of us to be trained by the Story Center in how to use digital storytelling in research and teaching. So a group of us were trained. Rachel went on to become a facilitator, and we wanted to pilot test. How can we use digital storytelling to help advance our research? So the point of a digital story is twofold. At one level, being able to tell your story, empowering your voice through making your own video with your voice is very self-healing. So there are a number of situations where um, digital storytelling has been used for self-healing. But it is also a great advocacy tool. Um, so the pilot that we chose was in partnership with the Iowa Harm Reduction Coalition, which is an advocacy group that also provides and supports uh, services for people who use drugs or have formerly used drugs, and works very hard to reduce stigma against people who use substances. Uh, and so Rachel and I and a, number, and a couple others uh, did a weekend workshop with some of the clients of the Iowa Harm Reduction Coalition to help tell their stories with the goal of reducing the stigma against substance use. But what we saw in these stories was that so many of the stories dealt with this syndemic of adverse childhood experiences. So I'm gonna play one of those stories for you, and I'll set it up just a little bit. Uh, this is a video made by a woman named Staniel, who is an incredibly brave woman who gave me permission to show her story here. Um, so Staniel had a very difficult child environment. She ran away at a young age. Um, after she ran away, she was a victim of sexual assault. Uh, she got involved in using substances. Uh, and then it was just a myriad of complexities, um, including car crashes. You know, every step she tried to take forward, something threw her back. So we will watch her story. It's just a 90 second video. So you hear Staniel say she wants to go back. She just wants to go back. I want to go back to when she was a baby. And I want to go back to when her parents were young. And I want to go probably back to when her parents were young, her parents' parents were young, and systemically change the trajectory that wound her up in this syndemic. And so the syndemic that has ensnared Staniel is really this one. Um, she experienced at child adversity that led her to be out of the home in an even more stressful situation. She experienced multiple forms of violence, perpetration, and victimization, and that became a very predictable uh, issue with substance use. Uh, so the interaction, again, with substance use is that ACEs, through this toxic stress, can lead to dysregulation of cortisol production that makes a person not only more likely to interact with drugs, but much more likely to become addicted when they use drugs. Uh, and then we also know that there's interaction between substance use and risk for interpersonal violence, uh, including suicide. And so at the social determinant level, uh, we know that communities with low resilience are likely to have fewer prevention programs, fewer of these balancing actions to reduce the deleterious effects of ACEs. Um, we know that things like stable housing is, and housing policy really works against single families and families of low means and families in which there's a substance user, again, compounding all of these issues. So I want to give you another example of a syndemic of a project that's just been funded by the Injury Prevention Research Center to Dr. Mark Berg, who's right here, in the Department of Sociology. And so it's long been known by people who work in the prison system that African-American men die really young from cardiac events. And there's never really been much of an understanding of why that exists. But compared to black men who are not in the prison system, 
Uh, black men in the prison system die much younger from heart attacks with a lot earlier onset of coronary disease, but also compared to their non-black uh, colleagues in prison, they die younger. And this pandemic that involves adverse child experiences and these compounding of stresses from early childhood are probably related. Uh, so we know that ACEs are overrepresented in inmates and in populations with early, early cardiac deaths. So we see this clustering. Uh, we also see this biological interaction that ACEs lead to this increasing genomic methylation, which happens uh, when your body is in a very persistent state producing too much cortisol. It's a persistent chronic response. Uh, and this leads to inflammation, sleep dis dysregulation, immune system disorder, again, how your brain stacks up. Uh, so you have early childhood st stress changing the way your brain is organizing, and then you have a stressful system with your brain hyperreactive to that stress. Uh, which is going to, you know, you look at these things like inflammation, sleep dysregulation, and immune system disorder, and these are all risk factors for early cardiac disease. Uh, so when you look in this systemic pathway, not such a surprise that we see this. But when we look at the social determinants, uh, we see African American males uh, have far higher rates of incarceration than any other race or ethnic group in our country. Um, and the biology of poverty has disproportionately concentrated people of color, color in environments that have low resources. Uh, so for example, after World War II, housing policy um, provided very inexpensive um, housing subsidies for white GIs. But those same subsidies were not available to people of color. So while we had the housing boom, we were selectively letting some people buy into that housing boom. And we systemically created uh, separation um, based on a structural racism issue. So Mark is looking at the biological uh, markers that lead to this early cardiac disease. Uh, and from that, we're gonna learn a lot about where from the individual standpoint do we see risk, but where from the systemic point do we see it? And I think it'll be a pretty mind-blowing conclusion if his research suggests that justice system and prison reform is one of the most important investments we can make to reduce cardiac disease. It's exciting because it's thinking outside the box, and it's thinking about a, about a systems change we can make that will have uh, impact in a positive way on a lot of other health outcomes. And it brings a lot of partners together. I don't know if we have any cardiologists in the room, but my guess is no one has said, boy, we need you on board to help advocate for, advocate for prison reform. So I feel like in my field, we are really at a crossroads. We are seeing an epidemic of suicide that's unacceptable, of substance use death, of alcohol-related death, of homicide. And we are not working fast enough or right enough to make a, a difference fast enough. Um, so adopting this endemic approach gives us an opportunity to think differently and more scientifically about how we can work in this big complex mess. So in the conventional approach of public health, we identify a health outcome. I have colleagues who are cardiovascular epidemiologists, colleagues who are injury epidemiologists, car you know, people who work on smoking cessation. Uh, but in this endemic approach, instead of this one disease, one intervention, we focus on a structure. And when we identify that structure, what are the challenges to health at the individual level in that structure? And how do we change that structure? So this approach has us thinking at a higher structural level of changes that can impact more outcomes for more people. So I'm going to introduce one more model, which is the socio-ecologic model, which is so public health is something we use every day, and it actually came from the field of violence prevention. And our dean, Edith Parker, is one of the experts that helped us implement this model in health behavior change. Um, so the socio-ecologic model takes the individual, you. It nests you and your health attitudes, your health behaviors, the things that influence the decisions you make in your interpersonal structure, in communities and organizations that you interact with, and finally, the socio-political society in which you live. And as we invest in interventions, moving from the individual to the societal level, we get more bang for our buck if we invest at the societal level. So you might ask, how do these levels, how does it relate to adverse child experiences? And so the, the organization that I wanna focus a little bit on is the workplace, uh, and talk about how we can use the workplace to address issues like suicide, very important opportunity. But you might be asking, how does adverse child experiences impact a workplace? Why would a workplace think about 
what has happened to people at a very young age. So as we think about the potential impact of adverse child experiences in the workplace, um, we can think about things like high absenteeism because we know health challenges are many. Uh, we can think about this notion of being very hyper-reactive to your environment. Uh, so that can lead potential to some stress in the workplace. And finally, difficulty concentrating and workplace distraction. And again, I want to emphasize the goal of this, one, is that everyone who's had adverse child experiences are not going to have problems in the workplace. But enough are that we need to think systemically about how we're going to do it. Um, and the notion is not to screen people from child adversity and then not hire them, uh, which we see you know, things like screening for diabetes and not hiring. That's, in the long run, not going to even solve that workplace's problem. So what can a workplace do? Uh, so workplaces that create and invest in supportive and flexible environments uh, that implement trauma-informed policies that help recognize behaviors are going to be influenced by the history of who you are. And if you have a voice and the ability for your workplace to accommodate those needs, it's good for everybody. Um, workplace structures that identify issues early and de-escalate those issues. And finally, support structures focused on mental health and suicide prevention. So now is a really interesting time to think about the workplace because we have a stressed workforce um, in that there are, we need more workers. Uh, we have a very low unemployment rate. And so workplaces need to retain workers, especially um, you know, in very big cities and where it's hard to house people around your business. Um, and one reason I really love working in the field of workplace violence prevention is that usually the strategies we come up with are good for the business. They're good for the bottom line. They're good for the employees. They're good for the wellness of the employees. They reduce insurance costs. Some of my colleagues who, you know, it's their job to make sure toxic chemicals aren't exposed to workers are often that's a much more regulatory approach that can cost the business money. It's easier when your solution is good for the business. So here is the syndemic. Um, and the components about violence in the workplace. And so individuals with difficulty in the work setting, for whatever reason that is, it might be acute, it might be because of a trauma history, um, are at higher risk for workplace assault and suicide, uh, but now we know also at higher risk for chronic disease as part of the workforce. Um, we know that high demand and high stress work uh, and work with low rewards increases risk for violence in the workplace. And we can change this in the workplace. We don't have to focus on the worker. Uh, we also know that workplaces that have poor response structures, who bury their head in the sand, we're not going to talk or be flexible about problems that happen, uh, lose an opportunity to de-escalate those situations in a way that can be positive for the work environment. And instead, these problems escalate. And that's one reason that we have so many active shooter drills in so many of our workplaces. We know that these individual and workplace factors multiplicatively interact. Uh, so there may be some baseline risk within the worker population. The way the workplace functions can create and exacerbate those issues, or they can provide that resilience building structure that de-escalates it. Um, and luckily, we know some strategies to go in the right way and build a more resilient workplace. So as far as social determinants, we're fortunate that we have a very strong Occupational Safety and Health Act in the US that really puts a high burden on workplaces to have a safe work environment. But even more so, workplaces are really starting to understand that poor health among the workforce, stress in the workforce costs them money in absenteeism, in productivity, and in engagement with the workplace. So at the moment, again, we have this high interest of workplaces uh, wanting to create healthier environments. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the work we've done at the Injury Prevention Research Center focused on building resilient workplaces. Um, so some of the first work that we did uh, was with a very large multinational company uh, where we worked with their threat management teams. So a threat management team in a large company is an interdisciplinary group. It'll include security, human resources, the medical group, the legal group, um, the EAP program, Employee Assistance Program, and it brings them together uh, to address workplace issues. Uh, and so the goal is to identify and de-escalate threats. So it's an intentional 
seeking out of problems really early on. You have to invest in looking for the problem and then train the team and the workers and what do you do to de-escalate it. Uh, so that's often by implementing trauma-informed policies um, and then following through these situations, not taking it a one acute issue, but seeing that, okay, this may be systemic and we need to think about the long-term impact. And so with this company, we came up with the workplace violence response model. Uh, and so basically, it follows phases of an event through the initial assessment. Something's happened. There's been a threat. Someone has a weapon on our campus. Uh, then moving to investigation, uh, and then to intervention and referral, and then debrief and follow-up and monitoring. And so moving through these systems um, while using an engaged process, so continually documenting, assessing, notifying, and consulting. Uh, so all the people in the unit, this is a much more broad approach, then we're going to deal with two people who aren't getting along. Um, you, you can identify and have a process for de-escalating the event. So in this company, which I'm allowed to say because they are authors on this paper, is the Boeing company, um, we examined the events that their threat assessment team responded to in a year. Uh, and they, they see a lot of things, a lot of really bizarre things. Going out to lunch with the Boeing threat management team is, is really interesting. Uh, <laughs> so you can imagine, because they're a threat management team, a lot of them were communicated threats, uh, a threat against the business or a threat by a worker against another worker, uh, but also abnormal behavior. And you're only going to find abnormal behavior if you ask about it. And if you're not finding it early, it's too late. There has already been a negative outcome to the person, to the people who work around them, and likely at the business level. But we also see issues with domestic violence and stalking, um, weapons possession, and suicide and suicidal ideation. So knowing they see all these really complicated things, how does this team, what does it do? How does it help? And so we evaluated the teams, and, but the Boeing company has 11 threat management teams. It's, they're a very big company. Um, and what we found, teams that were well-trained and experienced, uh, led to increased referral to resources. So going through this process of investigating intervention and referral, um, it turns out the people in security are really good at starting the investigation. But the fact that the human resources teams are there led to bringing referrals and interventions, helping put uh, supportive structures in place happened really early on. And it also de-escalated it because in something like a communicated threat, as workplace bullying is an example, often the root of the problem is not what you're seeing. There's retaliation, there are other people involved, maybe the two that ended up in the threat situation aren't even involved in the instigating event. And you're only going to find that if you have the ability to really ask broadly and have people trust you to tell you the information. Um, so they also found that the events that the team responded to were much less likely to lead uh, to retention, to firing or, um, or action against the employee. That's important. That saves the money business and helps keep their workforce. Uh, and finally, it led to de-escalation of the event. And often, the reports was that, you know, it was a really positive interaction with the threat management team. So I want to now talk just a second about how this structure can be helpful in thinking about suicide in the workplace. And it's not really that new that a lot of workplaces are, have been impacted by suicide among the workforce, sometimes at the work site, sometimes just by um, having a, a worker who committed suicide. And that has ripple effects that are they're very difficult and damaging to the workforce. Uh, and so in the Boeing company, about 7% of the events they responded to in one year were concerns about a worker who was expressing suicidal thoughts or who had committed suicide. We also worked with the threat management team of a, an unnamed large university, uh, but I will say this university has a, a very strong, well-structured threat management team. And then looking at the um, events they responded to in another year, it's not the same year, but 25% of those teams' responses were to concerns about suicidal behavior. What does a workplace do about suicide? It's touchy. It sometimes doesn't feel like you should go there. Uh, but it turns out there are very structured things that can happen to create support where you can identify suicidal ideology before it's suicidal behavior and provide infrastructures that help reduce the likelihood of a suicide. So I'm going to finish, make sure my timing is good, just with two examples of projects we're just launching 
uh, in the Injury Prevention Research Center to think about this workplace and suicide connection motivated by the recognition that we have to stem the tide of rising suicide rates, and the workplace gives us a very structured environment in which to do that. So in the first study, we are using data from the National Violent Death Reporting System, uh, which, our, I, I, which we feed into from Iowa. And it's, again, the first time there's comprehensive data collected to look at the circumstances of why some of these suicides are happening. Uh, so we can look at ACEs, we can look at financial stress, we can look at mental health disorders and diagnoses, family partner stress, substance use, and we can look at what, which of these are playing out in the workplace uh, and what structures could something like a threat management team use uh, to identify and respond to these circumstances? Uh, and how likely is it that different types of interacting circumstances will be found in their workforce? The second study uh, is recognizing that the means of suicide is very important. And if we can reduce the means, um, which could be everything from raising the rail on a bridge uh, to reducing access to firearms, which are the most common cause of suicide in our country. And so one interesting conflict that we're seeing right now is that businesses are implementing policies about firearms in their workplace. I'm going to use Boeing as an example because they're helping us with this study. They have a firearm-free policy. Now, Boeing has work operations in almost every state. So they have lawyers dedicated to tracking state policy that dictates problems with how they might be able to enact their policy workplace environment. Now, Boeing isn't telling anyone they can't own a firearm. They're not telling anyone they can't go through a licensing procedure to own a firearm. But they have decided the safest way to maintain their campuses is to have firearm-free campuses. So in some states, there are preemption laws being implemented that preempt the ability of local authority uh, to deny access to someone with something like a concealed carry permit to have that weapon with them. Um, so, so what's unclear is how that impacts private property. And the challenge is that in some states, courts are finding in favor of the business. And in other states, they're finding in favor of the preemption law. So it becomes really difficult for companies who want to have a firearm policy to know what they can do at the state level. And Iowa currently has um, two bills introduced, one in the House and one in the Senate, uh, that would allow anyone with a concealed carry permit or a permit at all to have that weapon in the parking lot. And it, as those are coming through the Senate and the House, it's not exactly clear in our legislation how that would impact private property. But it does impact state property. And so this is an issue that is also interesting to campuses, because in states with a preemption law, um, anyone who has a concealed carry permit would be able to keep that weapon with them on any state property, which would include a dormitory. Uh, so it's an issue that we think businesses have asked us for better guidance in how do we create policies with the safest environments and still be, um, you know, how do we work with states to address some of these conflicts? Um, so in working in firearm, I'm a firearm owner, but I'm also a firearm owner who is passionate about reducing firearm violence. Uh, and in the firearm culture I'm part of, we feel very similarly about that. Uh, so I do think that there is a lot of promise in thinking about systemic approaches uh, and where we can find opportunities to reduce the epidemic of despair, also recognizing we have an epidemic of firearm violence as well. So those are the examples I wanted to cover. And I want to conclude by saying what a huge honor it is to be able to share the research that my team, our, that you know, is part of my team that we do, uh, to show you a little bit about how we're thinking about moving forward. And that if you like this notion of a syndemic, jump on the bandwagon. We need all the players in the sandbox that we can get. Uh, so I really appreciate you spending your Sunday afternoon uh, here today um, and look forward to some questions from the audience. Wow, thank you, Cora. That was wonderful, broad, intriguing, <laughs> and I suspect it triggered a lot of discussions, if not debate, in our minds. It sounds like you'd be more than welcome to take a few questions. Absolutely, love thank to. You. And I also want to thank our
interpreter here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Noting that the workforce is not the only environment where we work or where we need to think broadly about interventions. I, I, I'm wondering about choosing that as a as your a best example because why not go back to schools or early childhood? Mm -hmm. Because maybe the workforce it's too late. I mean, somebody you can't go in and, and ask. Uh, Managers to psychoanalyze every, you know, and, and even the human resource department can't do that. It's very, it sounds very intrusive. And, and um, you know, you, managers expect people to come to work with problems but not bring them into the workforce. But we, we know that happens. People bring their problems with them. I, mean, I I'm familiar with hospital and health management through various associations here. So I've uh, been, been in that framework for a long time. And it just seems to me it's, I, I guess the question is, how is that a good environment? I mean, is, isn't that going to cost businesses more, not less, to, to have to bring in all of these Things. I mean, people who are, let's call them, for lack of a politically correct word, a damaged people who come in uh, to the workforce and, um, and have all kinds of problems, they're not going to last long. And you're saying, you think we can go back and fix all that early trauma, the, the aces you call them, from, from way back, have those corrected in the workforce so that they can be productive workers? I am saying that, well, so there are a lot of questions. Um, <laughs> so let me try to address it in three ways. One is why the workplace? So one, whether or not workplaces like it, these problems play out in violent events that happen in the workplace, in poor health that costs work places money. So what the workplace can do is create a responsive, supportive, resilient environment where people who have had all kinds of histories, and everyone has a history, can come to their workplace and, and perform at their optimal level. And I would say any employer in here pretty, is pretty interested in keeping their workforce. We don't have a deep bench of new workers coming out, especially in very specialized areas. Uh, so I would say that workers have already shown investment in wanting to create more resilient environments. Healthcare in particular has really been on the forefront of moving towards trauma-informed structures for themselves as well as for their patients because it's a very high stress environment. And they, you know, hospitals care a lot about retention. That's one of the biggest issues they have. And if they're creating environments that are resilient uh, and support, supportive, they're gonna keep their workforce, but also keep that workforce more engaged. Um, so then the question about why would you work in the workplace at all and why not go to early childhood? And the question with the syndemic is, yeah, we need to think about all these structures. And so I use the workplace because we happen to have a very large body of work uh, in the area of workplace violence and suicide. Um, but we do also work, for example, with the Iowa ACEs Coalition, um, which is the, a very advanced statewide coalition focused on early childhood development. And the work we have done is in the area of um, first five, so really early childhood before you're in schools, um, and then in the school system, and also in the youth correction system. Um, so I hope that started, got some of those pieces. <laughs> The uh, contest that you described between the states that are trying to allow people to enter firearms anywhere and the institutions that want to limit firearms are uh, each uh, rationalizing uh, their point of view in a different way. Uh, one point of view is that 
99.1% uh, .1 of the people who were hurt by uh, bullets, those bullets came from a gun. That sounds silly, but you know, the idea is that if you reduce guns, uh, you're going to reduce violence. And then you have the NRA uh, contending that uh, the way to keep uh, bad guys from using their guns is to have good guys with guns. Is it possible to contrast two groups of similar institutions, like for example, two universities, one of which operates in the state that permit that uh, is permissive for guns, and another in the state that allows the university to prohibit guns and see what the result is over time. Yes, we absolutely can. So the question was around the notion of um, wanting to move towards reduced firearm violence. And is the means to get there increased arming people so we have more defensive ability to stop a shooting in progress? Um, or is it more towards reducing access to firearms? It, from public health, really what I want to prioritize is preventing the interaction at all. <laughs> I want to prevent the violent event from happening, not just reduce how bad it is. Um, in, what's interesting in business is that some businesses are actually moving towards, and in federal legislation we see some of this too, of increasing the percentage of the workforce that's armed. And some businesses are implementing um, their own policy that uh, not only acknowledges but encourages their employees to obtain concealed carry permits. Others are moving towards wanting to have firearm-free places or businesses. And, you know, and the challenge is, what a, is a business supposed to do when whatever they, way they want to go is in conflict with the state? And so one of the really big challenges with firearms is that we don't have a lot of data. And there is a very structural reason we don't have a lot of data um, that I'm not going to go into here. Um, but if we look at progress that we have made in reducing um, disease from tobacco, so much of that came from data. <laughs> so the study you suggest is one that we really need to do, but no one's done it. We do not have very good data about what firearms are doing. And we don't get good media coverage either. So just as one example, they just um, adjudicated a case of a shooting in Colorado where seven people died. And what the news didn't cover very much was that during that shooting, five people were killed by the shooter, who was a former student. Who, who was just convicted. Um, two people, including a student and a first responder, were killed by a security guard who saw the first responder with a firearm and shot a student and the security guard. And we, there, that, there, that doesn't exist in any database <laughs> until we have the National Violent Death Reporting System. And nor was it something that was covered broadly in the media. So I can't tell you, does that happen a lot? Does that not happen a lot? I and mean, I can tell you, and this is not research at all, as a firearm owner, the thought of having a firearm in my classroom terrifies me because I am not trained to discharge a weapon in a crisis situation. Police are, military are, but I'm not. I don't trust myself to make that judgment, nor am I a very good shot. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I don't think I could be helpful. But you know, there's also, I mean, the gun culture I'm from is that if I point a weapon at someone, you know, God will strike me dead. And it's, it's just not in the nature of how I have been taught to interact with firearms to, to think that I am going to use it in a, in a preventive way. It's not what they do. You know, so I think we don't, not only need data on guns and what guns are doing, we need data on our gun culture and how that influences the outcomes we want. And in the data, I believe we will find answers. In the conjecture and the opinion, so far, I would argue we have not. Oh, actually, David and then Teresa. <laughs> Dean Johnson. <laughs> Thank you for your seminal work. And you apply these principles to this mega problem in the United States. Can you comment on how these principles might also apply to other areas? For example, people who've been through combat, uh, people who've lived in totalitarian countries, people who have survived mega disasters, and so on. It seems like the work you're doing would apply to a whole range of other uh, settings besides the ones you've really beautifully shown here. 
Yeah, so the comment is how does the work in this setting apply to larger populations at great stress? And so the example of combat troops, um, displaced populations, things like that, people who have experienced a disaster. Um, and absolutely, and luckily there are, there are a lot of people doing this work. And one thing I love being an academic in this field, especially with adverse child experiences, is that the practice community is way ahead of us. They're doing stuff and seeing what's working and they're making progress and they're crying out for a better evidence base. They want the researchers there telling them what works, what doesn't, how do we translate this, how do we tweak this? And so it's you know, kind of fun as a researcher to be kind of following along, trying to support all of these great efforts. And so I would say one of the big problems is we don't have a good evidence base. And the other problem is that we're just not doing enough of it. We are not concentrating our efforts on vulnerable populations in a way that we are increasing population level surveillance. And I worry when I look out at the world, we are accelerating disparity in the types of structural things that make us resilient. They're more accessible to those of us who need it the least. So I'm gonna to go to Teresa, um, and then I have, um, I don't know you, so <laughs> you, and then Frank, I'll come to you next. Um, this, your thank you, that was so fascinating. And one of the things at a meta level that's so impressive is the, the range of your collaborations on different projects, how many people in the brain are you working with, and I just wonder how do you go about building so <laughs> it's an interesting question from Teresa Mangum, who directs the Oberman Center, uh, which is like a think tank of collaboration. Um, so I really should ask you to answer that question, because you certainly have helped me create a lot of networks. You know, and I, you know, one thing I've learned from you, which is one way I do it, which I mean, I'm, a, I'm not very personable. I'm not very social. I'm not a very, not that I'm knocking myself, but it's a lot easier for me to sort of talk work with someone. But one thing I've learned from you is that talking person to someone creates such a richer relationship. And so I think it's very trauma informed to interact with a colleague as a human being first and as a work buddy next. Um, and, you know, and the other is the, the recognition that we have I mean, I, in the world I work in, it's not like team sports where you're gonna beat someone and feel good about that. I mean, we, it's a world where we have to work together and we, it's not competitive. We need everyone that we can possibly get interested in helping to help. Uh, so I think working in this, in this sort of world where we'll do better if we're engaged is wonderful because it just allows you to walk into a situation where you wanna learn from everyone. Uh, and it's, it makes it really rewarding too. So I, you had a... My question had really followed the same lines that hers did. It, it was impressive how, I mean, what a huge air, possible area of research you've chosen, many, many, many possible subjects, many of which already have well-established, long histories of work uh, in these areas. And, so, but the process of choosing must be a very difficult important. It's very difficult in that there's so much more to do and so little of it that it has viable funding streams. That is a huge frustration that worries me every day because my job is to bring in grants and a lot of this stuff, there's no natural link to a funding agency. Um, and I think you know, the urgency I feel in knowing we have ways to make a difference and we're not doing it is also very frustrating. And so one way to make partnerships are people who have, you know, are moving forward in that way and they have energy and they're doing stuff. Uh, but I will say, you know, you're, you know, why the workplace? A lot of the research, honestly, is somewhat opportunistic. You know, we had a partner, a big company come to us that needed some answers and we could work with them to give those answers. Why wasn't it a school or a Head Start program? You know, I don't know. <laughs> but but, but it's just the reality of the work we do is, is often opportunistic. And where are those partnerships ready to move? And, and what evidence can we support the work we're moving forward with? Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Yeah, yes. And so I would say the majority of our, in oh, read question, sorry. So Frank was asking about, we're ta I'm talking the structural level, um, but are there colleagues in psychology, uh, many fields, um, social work that are working more at the individual level? And, I, and yes, and it's very promising and their evidence base is growing. Um, and so I, I'm actually more optimistic at the progress being made at the individual level and it's that same necessary but not sufficient. So I think we need to drive more focus on the structural level. We're pretty uncomfortable with structural change. And in public health, it's really, you know, kind of our credo and help us, help us. I think Chuck Swanson. Mm -hmm. Is there much um, research done on when violence happens in the workplace that it's, um, it, there's a good chance that it will happen again? Um, you know, um, yes, there is some research. It's not enough. And the answer is, it depends. It, because workplaces are dealing with both issues that are brought into the workplace that can be acute circumstances, they could be very individually based, but it is absolutely true that some workplaces are violence prone. And it's workplaces that tend to be in industries that are very high stress, high demand, they can't change the industry, but they can change how they function within that industry. So structures that are, again, trying to implement trauma-informed policies, uh, working on identifying the problem and de-escalating it. I would say that is probably the most important thing. A workplace that buries its head in the sand is gonna have recurrent problems. Um, but a workplace that is really trying to create these structures, you know, and evidence has shown they have been able to de-escalate and retain and reduce absenteeism uh, and so much so that many workplaces are investing in these and with what I would like to be a stronger evidence base about what exactly are the components, um, but the desire to solve these problems from the work standpoint is pretty compelling to a, a workplace. Yeah, as an allied health profession, uh, professionally, I work as a dietitian with obesity and I see the intersection, as you previously mentioned, my question is, how are we integrating in our education system for medical students, residents, um, all allied health professionals and nurses, this language of um, the ACE, ACEs mm -hmm. and, and the trauma-informed uh, approach to assessment, for example, and treatment? Yeah, and what's interesting, so moving to trauma-informed threat management, it tends to happen in two ways. One is something big happens and the business decides we are gonna do business differently. Um, or something happens and it has cost the workplace so much. But other times, in working in hospital workplace violence, often it takes one advocate, one person who will not give up. Um, and I would say in our healthcare system, we have some of those advocates. We have them right now, active trauma-informed care projects going on in emergency medicine, in the trauma system, and some of those who do it are here today in um, the burn unit. Uh, so there are a lot of different ways. Um, but you know, I would really like to see a lot more in the educational system for all healthcare providers. I think right now the field that does it best is social work. Um, but I do know that in the medical curriculum here, uh, there are, at least there's one lecture, <laughs> one lecture that focuses on trauma-informed care. And it's you know kind of the framework that we wanna give people is sort of this notion of rather than, why are you doing this? What's wrong with you? But thinking, okay, here's what's happening. What has led to this? What's happened? Uh, so it's really just a way of changing the question, uh, you know, at, at its foundational level, and then having the support structures to refer and support when something has happened. First of all, thank you so much for coming. It's really awesome. It's really inspiring. Too. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's a student, so yay. <laughs> um, I just have a question about the nature of your research in regards to reactive versus proactive studies. Um, in the sense of doing research and developing plans accordingly, or putting different steps in place and then doing research to see if they're effective. What does that balance? The balance of reactive and proactive. You know, unfortunately, it's a whole lot easier to fund reactive studies because they are easier to collect data and they're cheaper to do. Um, so, and it, sometimes it's a little difficult to do an ethical, proactive, pro-forward, looking forward study. Um, so I would say 
we do more reactive studies of looking at what's happened in the past and learn what we can and then try to translate those lessons to the future. But boy, would we love to do more forward-looking types of studies. But I, so there's also the sort of the proactive reactive, are we trying to prevent things from happening or are we trying to cure them when they've happened? And it's frustrating for people in public health that we spend 80% of our healthcare dollars, 80% of our violence dollars on, I mean, we spend billions of dollars on the prison system. So far, every, almost every state now has a much higher budget to incarcerate people than to educate people. You know, so, it, it, so I would like to see in public health, we all say this all the time, we would like to see investment in prevention. We would like to prevent diabetes rather than cure it. I mean, we want to cure it. It's necessary to cure it and support people who are diagnosed. But how much are we investing on preventing it? And that is what drives us to thinking about these really complicated underlying factors, which in turn then makes us look at the multiple health outcomes that those factors are related to. Mary? I'm an engineer, a uh, legal engineer, and uh, uh, I, I'm working on floods. And uh, I make a parallel pandemic approach and what is done in floods. So it's clearly that the problem to be that, that the flood is not solved at where the, it takes place. It's a drainage area problem, which is very similar to the syndemic approach. It's a structure which um, carries all the, uh, the or, or is related to what happened at one place, the individual. So when this realization came, and even now it's not applying policy because we keep building levees and so on. Now you came to this realization of systemic is a bad approach, but there are no enough money to solve the problem of floods in the drainage area. So, do you have a, a, an answer about the cost? <laughs> Convincing people to go on that road because in floods it's a realization, but very few are going in that uh, direction. Yeah, so my engineering colleague was using the example of floods and how we spend a lot of money on levee systems. What we really need to do is solve the drainage problem, and there's not enough money in the world to solve all of the drainage problems, which then makes us think about where are we locating populations? Um, and what are we doing about flood management? Um, and yeah, that's a very good analogy. And so the question is, how do we advocate for investing in those really upstream approaches? And it's interesting, you have to know there's an exact analogy in engineering. I will say, and this is biased, it's going to show my training as an epidemiologist, that data, broadly writ, is the answer. And when I talk about data, it's not only about cost effectiveness evaluation data that tells you what your investment is going to get you, it's the qualitative data that tells the stories that make us care. And, and we need to work better together. Here's where collaborations that like the Oberman Center helps bring the quantitative and the qualitative and the storytelling people all together so we can create kind of the whole picture of here's the problem, here's why we have to care about it. And here, and you know, the interesting thing about these investments is they have to be collaborative because we have an incredibly siloed budget. We have what, over 400 budget lines in our federal budget and those are each you know, argued and um, appropriated independently. So how do you get the urban planners to care about the flood drainage budget <laughs> when it's just not part of their acute world? Um, so again, I think that data, again, broad data, qualitative, qualitative storytelling data can bring us to the bigger picture. And we need, you know, the time and the resources and the ability to tell the stories to, to try to make that happen. No, I, here, champions are critical, but we need, we need a lot of them working together with a lot of different types of skills. Okay, where are we getting it? I'm not watching it. Earlier, I suggested three reasons why we have these lectures. I don't, and now I'd like to let you in on a little secret of the fourth reason. The fourth reason is I truly believe that the 
the real strategic advantage at this university for the future is our ability, we're smaller, in case you haven't noticed, than most of our peer institutions. And I think that's actually an advantage. We're all in the same community. It's a pretty tight-knit community. And the issue of interdisciplinary collaboration, research, teaching, exploration is critical, I believe, to the future of the world and especially to this university. And so the other reason that we actually do these lectures is to suggest to all of us and remind us how important that is and to suggest be like this in your career because this is a wonderful example of our future and the importance of all of us working together as a community. And even when Marianne in flood research is now using syndemics to talk about floods, it's just phenomenal. This, this is what we need. The other thing I'd like to suggest is we touched on a number of issues around gun control. We talked about prison reform versus education. And during this political season that we're now in, I think it's high time. We're all so frustrated with something. But I think it's high time that we start asking some of these questions, not only of our colleagues here at the university, but for the people who are running to represent us. It's high time that we actually allow a lot more research on a number of these issues. We need to get the data on gun control. You sidestep very nicely the core issue, which is there is legislation out there saying that if we take federal money, we can't do a research in a number of these areas. That's got to stop so we can solve some of these problems. Please join us downstairs at the Rotunda for the continuation of the conversation and the little libation. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Corey.